Welcome to the Center for Universal Oneness. We are an open, welcoming, spiritual community that supports all faith traditions and invites you to join us on your spiritual journey. We host different speakers each week to guide and inspire us. We are guided by universal principles of acceptance of all that is sacred, and we strive to live in the oneness of love. Please enjoy this presentation. Kelly was our uh, classmate at Unity School of Christianity. She has all kinds of credits to her background, including, I did not realize, she has a master's in um, the BA in anthropology and archeology. span And of course she has her uh, master of divinity from Unity School. She's lived in many, many places over her lifetime. And it's given her a real broad view of um, cultural and religious diversity and their inherent oneness. Um, she's of course an ordained unity minister. She wears many, many hats um, that you can read in last week's newsletter, the old ones. And more recently, she has a podcast on Unity FM with Ogan Holder, um, focusing on anti-racism. She's also done lots of work interfaith and with the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council and has just recently been nominated to the board, is that right, Kelly, of the National World War I Advisory Council. Yay, yay, Kelly. She wears many, many hats and she wears them well. Her talk today is good news, great joy, all people. Kelly, take it away. Yeah, I love that. I laugh whenever someone goes, you know, wearing many hats because I have a huge head. Like, I don't mean that as a metaphor, like when you measure, you know, because uh, in my undergraduate degrees, one's anthropology, one's archaeology, which requires taking some human osteology classes, because if you're going to excavate, you know, things, you, per you periodically come across excavating really old bones. And so you learn to measure the size of bones, which help, which helps you one kind of identify uh, gender very often. So you first learn to measure your own skull. And that's when I learned that I have a huge noggin and that it falls squarely. So there's a range for um, uh, female gender skulls and there's this range in centimeters you know, for male. And my head centimeter wise and volume wise <laughs> falls at the larger end of the male spectrum. I'm like, great. That's what it like. I don't feel weird enough in life, right? Now I have a big head, so I always joke. I laugh when someone talks about the many head hats because I never wear them. I absolutely never <laughs> wear them because I have a huge noggin, and and oftentimes they're just too small. Like they're they're made for you know, and women's hats in particularly for like delicate heads, and I'm like anything but delicate. Um, you know, I can have a delicate touch. Like I have really small hands and fingers, you know, delicate touch, you know, you have with words sometimes, but not hats. So anyway, <laughs> total squirrel moment, <laughs> totally. Uh, <laughs> but I do, I do metaphorically, you know, um, wear many hats. And and what Susan was referring to was, um, and since we're all here in the, you know, can't, I think pretty much everyone on, I may not, this may be a little inaccurate, is in the Kansas City area. If you've never been to the National World War One Museum and Monument that's in downtown Kansas City, um, it's an amazing, amazing place. It's a brilliant uh, museum. It's I didn't know what I didn't know about World War One, um, and it's really interesting. My how I got involved with them um, because I, because of the Inter Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council I, a couple years ago before COVID shut down, got involved with them and was helping them in expanding the museum <clears throat> to include, you know, a huge, not just a, a temporary installation, you know, or exhibit on faith in World War I, but permanent, you know, a permanent um, section that was about the role of faith in World War I um, in terms of all, you know, if you, when you look at the, you know, the different faiths that um, served, people that claim different faiths that served uh, actively in World War I, it's really quite amazing. And what shocked me was that, was one, my interest 
Like I, 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 you know, anthropology, archaeology, so anything that's historical, I don't care how old it is, you have my attention. But I almost started to wonder, uh, and some of this, you, some people may resonate with, some people not, but I really started to think, I wonder if I had a previous life in World War I, because there was such an emotional heart connection to this museum and, and all the conversations. So this last week, I was asked to... Um, to join the, um, it's newly formed, but the Faith Advisory Council for the museum um, to, to help serve the greater Kansas City area in, in the role of faith in World War I. And, and because it is the national, national museum and monument and people come from all over. So, um, so I, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that, which it does kind of go along with my talk title, Good News, Great Joy, All People. Good news, great joy, all people. Um, I, uh, um, you know, I just, it's usually you hear that when you, when it's like Christmas time, right? Good news, great joy, all people. We're used to hearing it in terms of, um, you know, Christmas, in, in terms of the, the scripture from Luke, right? The angel comes and says, you know, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. And um, <clears throat> so, but I'm not gonna talk about it in terms of Christmas. I'm actually gonna talk about it in terms of, uh, I think it's a wonderful to-do list. And I say that with great hesitation because I, if you're like me, I don't need another to-do list. If I could take the camera and show you all the colored sticky notes sitting in front of me or around my monitor, I'm all set. I don't need any more to-do lists. But one of the reasons I like sticky notes is because you can just take it off and crinkle it up like this one. See, that, that task got done. I crinkled it up, it goes away. Um, so I, I kind of joke about, I don't really need another to-do list and uh, it's, but it, it's a really kind of a good one. It's just three things, good news, great joy, all people. Um, and I got the idea from, <laughs> You know, you, you, if, you, if you've met me, you know my brain sometimes works interesting, connects interesting dots. But I got the idea from actually from uh, some, some of those late night infomercials, you know, where, <clears throat> where the person is, um, sometimes they're almost yelling at you. Like, you know, you need this, you have to buy, the, you know, whatever it is, the latest broom, the latest stepladder, um, the latest toaster, you know, whatever it is. And it's this huge proclamation of how there, you know, what whatever this gizmo gadget is, is going to transform your life in ways that you couldn't ever imagine, right? And I think in large part, they're promising a little more in transformation and our emotional and physical well-being than that simple toaster oven or garden hose is really going to be able to deliver. Um, but boy, they just really get into it, right? They, you, if you listen long enough, you kind of sometimes it feels a little smarmy, you know. But, but, but I, but if it's late enough and the brain is not quite all the way on, I find myself going, really? Are you sure? Like, you, I sometimes I get a little sucked in. But the really lofty claims, and I, what I really love is just how enthusiastic they are. Whether it's real or fake, I just really love the enthusiasm. I'm like, well, at least you have a job that you can you know, get, get behind and really get passionate about and, and really get enthusiastic. And so that's, that's kind of how it came about. Like, it, I don't think I heard a, an infomercial person, spokesperson say, good news, great joy, all people, but it popped in my head, right? Here's all this good news for this, this garden hose that's never going to, you know, get twisted and, and you know, break or anything for the rest of your life, or you'll never have to clean out the gutters on your house ever again for the rest of your life for the next 150 years kind of thing, right? So it, it just, and they're so enthusiastic, I, you know, the joy part. And then there's always some claim how it doesn't, it's this, this little product is good for everybody. It doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what product, whether you're cutting tomatoes or you're going to cut a soda can in half, or you need to trim you know, the roses outside, or, you know, that it's good for all people, for all things. So when I, that's kind of, there's a few more dots in there to connect, but, but that's kind of where the idea came from. Good news, great joy, all people. And at the same time, recognizing that, well, that's the message that we often hear at Christmas. 
right? In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So I want to break it down because um, I think it's really in terms of a to-do list, you know, good news, great joy, all people. You know, I can kind of look back on my day and see what is, you know, what does this really mean? What is the good news? So that's the place I want to start is what's the good news? And I want to start there, um, uh, what, not just because it's the first thing, but because I think for me, it's kind of one of those that that I can I can maybe breathe by a little too quickly. And what I mean by that is, I don't think good news necessarily always has this sense of, or like the feel good or yeah, you know, like it's really comfortable. I think good news, you know, good kind of in quotations, um, doesn't necessarily um, have, you know, all wrapped up in, in, feeling really comfortable and feeling really happy or feeling really, you know, um, you know, good for lack of a better word. You know, the, those claims when the angel comes and, and says the angel comes to, you know, to the shepherds, right? In the gospel of Luke, it's this angel that comes to the shepherds. Um, just as a piece of Bible trivia, doesn't happen in the gospel of Matthew. The two gospels that have birth narratives, Matthew and Luke, uh, no shepherds in Matthew. So the angel comes to the shepherds in Luke and tells them, don't be afraid, brings good news. Now, stop and think for a minute. If I'm a shepherd, you know, wandering in the dark um, and, and this angel appears claiming that there's this one child that's come and, um, and, and describes this child, right, as this, um, you know, this, this little baby, newborn baby, and all these things that this child represents. If I'm a shepherd, I'm listening to this and I'm like, I'm thinking the infomercial, like all these lofty claims, like really? For this one little nondescript baby that's lying in a feeding trough is going to make good on all these claims? You know, um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not, and I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just trying to kind of, it's good news. Right, and come, you know, the seeds within the, that, you know, from the angels as it's written is encompassing this good news. And as I'm listening to it, if I'm a shepherd, I'm going to go, hmm, that's a lot. <laughs> right? You haven't gotten some news where you're like, I'm not sure what to do with that. I, I personally, um, of course, I'm projecting my 21st century world onto, you know, 2000 years ago as a shepherd, but. I think that some of them would have been justified in making a hard pass and going, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep wandering in the dark to some place that I don't know because there's a baby that's bringing all of these lofty lists of gifts and features and going to save the, like all this stuff. And I don't know, but for whatever reason, the writer of the Gospel of Luke decides the shepherds are all in. And not just that they're all in, but they eventually become very, you know, for lack of a better term, very passionate pitchmen themselves, right? They become messengers themselves and not just kind of, sort of, but, you know, using the information and letting the world know more. So uh, in looking at um, what is good, you know, I'm, I'm a word nerd, so I always go back to the origins of the word. And when you look at you know, the thing about good news, as I said, it isn't, it doesn't always feel comfortable, right? When you lose a job that, that maybe I wasn't willing to leave, right? I, I didn't want to quit the job and yet I've lost the job. Um, you know, the death of a loved one after a really long, painful illness. There's a, there's a good news element. You know, I know when my beloved died, when my dad died, there was an element of good news in there. It wasn't the first thing I thought, right? But after a long, painful illness, there's this, this, this element of, uh, of the quote unquote good news. So when I look at the root of the word good, um, it really means desirable. It means complete. It means um, uh, like assembled, like it's, it belongs together. 
that's when you keep digging. That's one of the things I love about the etymology of words is as you keep kind of digging into their origins, you just find some interesting starting places. And so um, good news is something that's beneficial, but I really love the belonging together piece um, because the while the experience of goodness comes with feelings of well-being and comfort and you know, the, that life is rewarding and uplifting, um, you know, those come as a byproduct, right? Like, think about it. We talk about, oh, it was like, what'd you do last night? Well, I was at my friend's house. We had good food. It was good music. The weather was good. You know, I came home and I slept really good. Um, you know, there's the, we use the word good with a lot of things that produces these kind of uplifting and rewarding and meaningful um, comforting, uh, well-being um, experiences. But we can also use the word good uh, pragmatically. You know, we can use it in terms of morality and virtues. Um, and we can, you know, judge things as good in terms of their usefulness. Um, it's just how we use the word, right? Good is one of those meaning-making words that for, you could probably ask everybody, what do we have, 22 people on here? Ask 22 people for a definition of good, <clears throat> and you might get some similarities, but probably some 22 different things. And even if you ask about an experience that's good, you know, or good news, but I, I just want to, for me, it's really important that, that good news, the idea of that there's good news every day uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it feels really comfortable. Um, but within whatever's, whatever's going on in my world, there is a seed of good news. That doesn't mean spiritual bypassing. It doesn't mean put on my rose colored glasses and find, you know, the good thing, but that, you know, the, that my life experiences, I can look at them and, and decide to experience them as something that is good working for me, that we belong together, right? I go back to that belonging together thing. It's just how I make meaning of what's going on around me. So good news, right? Which means that it's that's on the first thing on my to-do list. So I look at my day and say, what was the good news? And see, see what the good news is. Sometimes it's very apparent. Other times I have to, you know, kind of have to dig under the pile. I know there's a pony under there somewhere, kind of thing. Um, but I, I also think about, it reminds me of the, probably terrible, but reminds me of the, uh, you know, the infomercial salesman, you know, at the more that they sort of unpack this product for you, the more you find the little features that, okay, now I'm sold. And I'm there I go clicking away. <laughs> um, so that's what I do with the news in my day. I just sort of be with it and look at it. And where is the, the good news in there? Again, not dismissing anything that's uncomfortable, but belonging together, like being with it all. So great joy. Um, also, uh, you know, in terms of the Christmas story out of the Gospel of Luke, um, the, the scripture says, um, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Right? So Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Mary being the mother of Jesus. So Mary um, goes to visit Elizabeth. They both of them are, are um, expecting. But there's this conversation about joy, you know, that, that upon the hearing the greeting, right? Greeting, hearing the words, leaping for joy. Um, and so, so how do I, so I look at joy then as, um, it's not about happiness, right? Sometimes I think we, Sometimes I hear what may sound like a little confusing around joy and happiness because they're not the same thing. Joy is something that's always everywhere present, but I may not be tapped into it. Happiness is more of an external thing. Something external goes on and I respond to it. Um, so the joy piece is really an invitation. You know, if I look at that scripture from Luke where um, as soon as uh, they heard the sound of the greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Um, the, it's an invitation into how am I coming into this season? How am I coming into this experience? How am I coming into my day? Right When I hear uh, a greeting, when I hear the beginning of the day, when I hear the beginning of 
you know, I get on the phone with a person, when I hear the beginning of go have dinner with friends or family, right? Family's a good one. Like the minute I'm in their presence, as am I leaping for joy, you know, or have I set up my, you know, I got to wait and see, right? Have my little guard up. Um, but it's the question is, how am I coming into this season? And it's not, and I don't even mean, I'm not talking Christmas season. I'm meaning season, like metaphorically, you know, just as a term, how am I coming into this day? How am I arriving in this moment? How am I arriving in this experience? So if you go back and think about the shepherds um, and they decided they were all in, but how do you think they were when they showed up at the, finally showed up at the manger? Like, how did they come to the manger? Well, I'm pretty sure they were curious. Okay, so we've been told there's this little nondescript baby in a feeding trough that's got all this promise and all these words. We've been traveling a long way. So I'm going to guess maybe a little tired, maybe a little hungry, certainly curious. Certain, I would think grateful, just, oh, whew, we made it, you know, stop and rest. Were they angry? Were they afraid? Were, you know, how did they come to the manger? How did they come to the experience? Um, so that's the, the great joy, right? Um, is how do I, when the good news, right, arrives, whatever that is, doesn't necessarily feel comfortable, but how do I arrive? How do I come to that season? How do I come to those words? How do I come to that experience? Um, and however it is, is fine, right? That's the thing about the shepherds is however they showed up is fine. I'm not suggesting one way or another, um, but rather just noticing, right? It's part of my, here's good news, great joy. Um, and so however I show up is perfectly fine because joy is, um, is just, it's immutable, it's perennial, it's eternal, it's internal. You can't take it away. Um, it's always present. Um, <clears throat> it's just whether or not I'm kind of tapped into it. So it's not joy for me is not dependent on something outside of me, but rather it's, it's always everywhere present. And if I am, you know, if I've kind of gone through my good news and how am I arriving at this, this experience that I'm having, you know, with joy, maybe with despair, with celebration, maybe with grief, with, you know, belief, or maybe with some doubt, but that's it, it you know, the pausing and being with the good news, so to speak, allows me to, um, to just be with what is, which then leads me into um, whatever, whatever I'm feeling. And the more that I do that, the more I'm invited into, you know, a peaceful place, which is joy. Joy is peace dancing, right? Joy is peace that has legs and is moving around and is, you know, uplifting and is empowering and is quickening, right? If we want to go back to the being pregnant metaphor, the word quickening doesn't mean speed. It means bringing to life. It's coming to life. So um, that's the, the great joy is a place that I can move into. It's not about not being with what is, but rather being with what is and, right, the good news is belonging together, what's, what am I leaving out that maybe I need to bring in? How am I coming to this season? How am I coming to this experience and naming it? And then coming to, uh, uh, to the place of great joy. And again, great joy looks a lot of different ways. You know, I, you could be experiencing great joy on the inside and I may not know it on the outside. That's fine. It's yours, right? So good news, great joy, all people. This is the probably one of the tougher ones on the to-do list because all people means all people. Not just the ones that are easy to like, not just the ones that are easy to love, but all people. It's interesting that in the that in the Gospel of Luke, um, Jesus is born in, in he's laid he's in a manger. And a manger is literally a feeding trough. Um, so that's what he's that's what he's laying in. Um, and so the feeding trough, again, another symbol of, you know, it's what, so when I say all people, I mean all people. So what am I feeding all people? You know, what am I feeding in terms of, um, you know, how I'm showing up? Because however I show up, 
I'm feeding the space with all of me, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. So if you've ever been around me when I'm grumpy and I'm annoying, then, you know, what, what I'm bringing to the space might not be very tasty. Um, and so what the flip side of that is, though, is what is what are you bringing to the space? You know, when someone is hard to love, love them harder. You know, put a, put feed, you know, give something else into the space for the person to feed on. You know, so and all people, the people that are the hardest to love need to eat the most. It sounds just a little odd. Um, sort of way to talk about it, but, you know, the, the eating each other, there's actually a word for it, alterphagy, but to, to feed on each other means what am I bringing to this table? What am I bringing to this season, right? That to eat of each other and, um, and it can be really tasty or not. So am I bringing something that is, that will perpetuate, you know, the good news that will perpetuate the joy that will perpetuate how I want our world to be? Because if what, if there's, if peace is missing in the space I'm in, if forgiveness is missing in the space I'm in, if joy is missing, if compassion is missing, if kindness, guess whose responsibility is to bring that dish to the banquet table? Me. Even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't think I can, you know, oh my God, I can't bring any more peace and calmness because I'm a wreck. Well, guess what? I can. We are teaching in unity, we are fully human and fully divine. So I have access to every divine idea. Just gotta pause, okay? Gotta be, what's the good news? What am I bringing to this season? What am I bringing to this tradition? Right. So can I deliver on the promises of the angels? Good news, great joy, all people, right? The, the, uh, that infomercial guy or woman that promises all of these things for this little, you know, fabulous little paperclip. That's sort of like a MacGyver thing, right? Here's a paperclip and a garden hose and you can save the world. But that's the, that's the idea, you know, of this good news, great joy, all people. And it's looking, you know, using that kind of as my to-do list is I look for direct ways to um to bring news that is good not always comfortable right it's really important we get that that the news is good like right now we are in our world in our culture in our country you could pick the city you're in there's a lot of crap going on there's a lot of discomfort there's a lot of anger there's a lot of change there's a lot of discomfort there's a lot of pain there's a lot of suffering and we keep moving Right. The good news is we have the capacity to be with all that and to little by slowly bring something different into that space, which then is the great joy. And it is for all people. I don't have to like them. I don't even have to love them. But I, you know, I don't get to pick and choose my good news for only this group of humankind over here or only this part of life. All, all means all probably one of our harder harder things to be with is all people. Because I don't know about you. I know I've done this before. I've asked this before in church services. But, um, you know, you have somebody that's kind of hard to like. It's hard to love. I do. I do. And I have moments when I wish to God they would go away. Like my life would be so much easier if you just went away. And yet the irony is that that's the person that is, that I need to be with, right? Good news, great joy, all people. So we're going to take that idea into meditation. So if you're comfortable, you can close your outer eyes. You can leave them open or just lower your gaze. your eyes are open, just have a soft gaze on whatever's in front of you. Take a deep 
breath together, inhale. Good news, great joy, all the joy. With the next inhale. something going on right now that's an experience where there's some uncertainty. An experience where there's some questioning. that doesn't feel comfortable maybe. And, and allow yourself to, as you imagine it, you bring it to life. It doesn't have to be anything big. There's something in life, in a relationship, having an experience within yourself, with a friend, with your faith, with a family member, illness or finances. If there's something that just has some questioning or a little uncertainty, next breath in, just scan, scan your interior body, see if there's a place that's feeling a little contracted. See if there's a place that's feeling a little tight. is the good news. If there is a place that feels contracted or tight or a little in the dark, it belongs with the rest of you. That is the good together. It is an experience that is for you, for your greatest
what is the great joy? What is the great joy? If you breathe in again, there are places inside that has a sense of peace, of grounding, settled. put a smile on your face. When we smile on our face, our heart smiles, our body smiles. We activate that great joy. sense of that great joy, we now harness it and hold an intention to bring that to the moment. It could be with just a smile, your presence, showing up. Holding the intention, the attention. This is ours to you each day. To recognize the good news. To activate the great joy. Knowing it is for all. Stillness 